The week-long dead period is over for recruiting, which means we have a whole host of new names that are linked to the Hoosiers, including a national champion, UConn Husky. You are Locked On Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into this Friday episode of Locked on Hoosiers as we get ready to send you into the weekend with all the latest rumors and reports regarding the transfer portal. First, though, I'm your host, as always, Jacob Rude. want to thank you for making us your first listen, your first watch every single day. We are your one and only daily one-stop shop for IU Athletics. Three new names to talk about on this episode and a little bit of an update on a name that we previously mentioned. We're going to start though with Naheem Aleen guard from UConn entered the transfer portal on Thursday. IU pretty quickly reached out to him. He's someone that last season played for UConn. He spent three seasons at Virginia tech, went to UConn, Went from a starter to a bench player with the Huskies. Uh, Just kind of across the board wasn't as effective statistically. He won a national title. He played in all 39 games. Like, he was good. He wasn't maybe as good as he had been in the previous seasons. Now entering the transfer portal for his final year of eligibility. As I said, Andrew Slater is the one who says IU reached out to him. Uh, within kind of the opening hours of him entering the transfer portal. You can look at at some of what he did statistically and just kind of see where things changed for him. I mean, for one, he averaged 18 minutes per game. The previous season at Virginia Tech, he averaged 31. I'm sure it was probably made clear to him that he'd have a different role, but this was a, a vastly different one, if we're being honest. Fewer shots fewer three pointers, just fewer th- across the board. Even if you look at like per 40 numbers, um, he just wasn't as a fed season. It's sometimes it's a hard adjustment for guys to, to go from being the guy to a guy on a, on a roster. He averaged uh, last season, 5.2 points and 1.2 rebounds, 0.8 assists. But if you look at his three seasons at Virginia Tech, it was 9.7 points, 2.6 rebounds. Um, Over his career, he's a 37% three-point shooter. Having said that, last season with UConn, it was 30.5%. So again... I'd imagine the belief is that if you give him a a role, something similar to what he had at Virginia Tech, uh, perhaps it would lead to better results in terms of three-point shooting. His three-point rate went uh, down just a tick last season. I think in general, it was just kind of a, a different, like I said, a different role for him. His free throw rate dropped drastically, which to me would indicate he was maybe driving the ball less, maybe playing a little more off ball. His usage rate was down significantly from his time in Virginia Tech. If you want to look at kind of some of the advanced numbers on him, uh, again, nothing jumps off the table necessarily. He was good offensively. He was good defensively. This was just in general a good UConn team. He played mainly as a shooting guard, played in some three guard lineups to where he was listed as a, maybe as the three in those lineups. He doesn't have a a ton of size, six, four guard, 195 pounds. So uh, he would be a guard for the Hoosiers. The Hoosiers need guards, but he also last season, we talk about the role that you have, whether it's one as a creator or five as a receiver, he was a 4.8. So that lends further credence to the fact that he was playing off the ball, maybe more as kind of a spot-up shooter. If you look at his last season at Virginia Tech, uh, he was, um, again, kind of a shooting guard, little less in terms of a receiver, but that's kind of the guy he is. 
he just had more minutes, more opportunities with Virginia Tech. So uh, maybe a chance for him to find a new landing spot and become the guy he was again at Virginia Tech. Certainly a name worth monitoring moving forward. Another player that entered the portal and IU reached out to pretty quickly, Matthew Cleveland from Florida State, 6'7", 200 pounds. Uh, Joe Tipton is the one who says the Hoosiers have reached out to him among, I mean, you guys have seen, there's a lot of schools that reach out to a guy right away. So it depends on, there's varying levels of interest from both parties in that regard. He spent two seasons at Florida State. Last year, he averaged 13.8 points. 7.4 7.4 rebounds, shot 44% from the field, 35% from the three-point line on two attempts per game. Uh, someone listed, I mean, <laughs> some of the rosters I saw list him as a guard. He's more of a forward. Uh, this is a guy that, a little bit of a leaner body, but someone that I think would play on the perimeter as a forward for the Hoosiers last season with Florida State, it was he was listed as a 4.3, which means he played mainly power forwards, a little bit of kind of small ball five maybe, or in some five out lineups, he played as a five there. But, I mean, he's not someone that is – his three-point rate was 17%. For a reference point, Race Thompson's three-point rate was 21%. That's basically a measure of – how many of your field goal attempts are from three-point range. So he takes threes less frequently than Ray Thompson did, and Ray Thompson didn't take threes. So this one's an interesting one. Really good rebounder, um, especially for someone who six, seven, 200 pounds. There's not, he's not someone like Trace Jackson Davis, who's just a big body that can move guys around, but his rebound rate of 13% was right there with race Thompson. So he's a good rebounder for his size. It would be interesting. He started every game last season for Florida state. I don't know that he would, he might be a starter. The The Hoosiers have an opening at small forward. Maybe that's where they see him again, a guy who his freshman year shot 17% from three. I don't know that that's a guy you want coming in as you're starting small forward, but he's only played two seasons. So he has two seasons of eligibility. Maybe he's not looking to go somewhere to start right away. We'll see. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to like there again, Evan Mia. He wasn't, he was good offensively. Wasn't great defensively last season. Uh, Played more as a, his his role was a 3.2. So maybe someone that's a little bit more of a, uh, creator than the previous player we mentioned, Aline, but he's not someone that's creating off the dribble all that much. He he brings more to the table offensively than defensively, but we'll see again. I this one seems maybe a little less certain, but there there's a lot of people that I use reaching out to. These are kind of cursory glances at them. If I use starts bringing them in for visits and stuff like that, we can dive a little deeper. But this isn't even it. We have two more names to talk about. One we have previously discussed and one that is another new name and a shooter. IU needs those. So we'll talk about who that is here in a moment. First, let's talk about Built Bar. If you guys are looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories and you need need the best tasting protein bar ever built, you guys got to try this. You hear us talk about it all the time. I promise we're not gassing it up for no reason. They are actually very tasty and they are healthy for you protein bars that taste like candy bars are covered in chocolate still just have 130 calories four grams of sugar 17 grams of protein you can get them at built.com like we always talk about that's where you can find uh any of the flavors but if you guys are heading to walmart heading to sam's club they're available in both of those locations as well so you don't have to order and then wait on it to ship and arrive you can head out this evening, this afternoon, whenever you're listening to this, and go pick up some some built bars and try them out yourself. So do, do that today, whether it's head to the grocery or head online to built.com, and you can thank me later. Big shout out to you guys for making us your first listen every single day. Let's keep that push going over at YouTube if you're watching us 
and you are not subscribed, click that subscribe button. If you normally listen to us on Spotify or iTunes or Overcast or whatever app you may use, just head on over real quick. You don't even have to pause us. Just head over to YouTube real quick. Subscribe to Locked on Hoosiers. We're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers before we hit kind of the dead months of June and July. Now, let's get, get you some more guys whose highlights you can watch to waste away the rest of your day at work. Cormac Ryan, who is a transfer from Notre Dame. He is he's set for his sixth season of college basketball. Um, Rab Johns is the one who says IU has been in touch with him. He started his career at Stanford, transferred to Notre Dame before there was a waiver. So he sat, he redshirted that season and then played the last three years at Notre Dame. Last season, he averaged 12.3 points, four rebounds, two and a half assists, uh, shot 40% from the field, 34% from the three-point line. He he is a shooter. And as I said, as we were kind of teasing into this, this is, I you need shooters. His three-point rate was 55.8%. Miller Cop is the only person. Miller Cop shot 68.3%. Uh, uh, his three point rate was 68.3%. Miller Cop only shot threes. I mean, that's the ballpark that we're talking here. Tamar Bates is the only one close at 51% last season. So uh, Ryan gets up threes and he makes them with far more efficiency than Tamar Bates did last season. He. Uh, last year, as we said, he shot 34%, which isn't great. That's just above um, Jalen hood Shafino. Actually, last season, Tamar Bates shot better, but over their career, or excuse me, two seasons ago, it was 40.7% for Ryan. So he had a flash there. Now, that could be the outlier. If we're looking at three-point percentages, it was 31% as a freshman, 34.4%. 40.7, 34.4. So it's just as possible that that uh, junior season was the outlier there, and he's just kind of a 34% three-point shooter. It, it would be interesting to see him in a situation with the Hoosiers where he would be a shooter, like IU needs him to be a shooter. That's I think it's not a coincidence that uh, three of the four names that we're going to mention in today's episode are guards and guys that can play on the perimeter because that's what IU needs. Last season, according to Evan Mia, uh, he was Notre Dame's best player just based on their uh, Bayesian performance rating, the metric that they use. You everydayers will know, and we referenced that a lot. He was their second best offensive player, was just kind of barely average in terms of defense, but overall that made him their best player last year. His position was a 2.2, so mainly a shooting guard that, again, kind of played in a little bit of three-guard lineups. His role was a 2.7, though, which means he, he can create a little bit. Uh, he doesn't have any kind of crazy high assist percentage, 14.4% assist percentage, which is just an estimate on the percentage of field goals that player assisted when – uh, on the floor that is in line with Trey Galloway a little bit a little bit above Trey Galloway so that tells you just what type of creator he is his role if he came to Indiana though would be as a shooter and you can't have too many of those and IU certainly needs them and they had basically one last year and he graduated Miller Cop graduated so that would absolutely be the role he would play at Indiana again this is early on, but this is someone um, he feels a really big need for the Hoosiers. I, I don't, again, I, I'm not going to pretend I know a lot about him. I've probably read the same things and watched the same highlight videos that you have. I can do a deeper dive again. If I start bringing these guys on campus is when I start doing really deep dives because otherwise I'm going to be watching hours and hours of highlight videos for guys that, aren't even really considering Indiana. Let's wrap it up talking about L. Ellis. That's a name we mentioned earlier in the week. Um, 
IU has not only been in contact for him, they are, it seems to be, pushing for a visit. Ellis has entered his name into the draft. It seems like maybe that's just kind of one of those, I'm going to find out what scouts say about me so I know what to work on um, next season type of moves. There is some reason. Uh, the, the reason I want to mention his name, Rab Johns did an article about him kind of talking about the beliefs some coaches have. Something I honestly, I didn't catch, I didn't mention. We talked about him being basically an inefficient player last season. Shot 41% from the field, 31% from three. He scored 17 points. He was playing for an awful Louisville team, and I wrote off too much of that. He was basically asked to do everything for that Louisville team. If you look at some of the advanced numbers, his usage percentage jumped drastically, but not just that, his assist percentage. His freshman year, when he was a more efficient player, he shot 36% from the three-point line that year. I would take that. That type of player I would take. He was just overall more effective. His assist percentage that year was 16%. So when he was on the floor, he assisted 16% of every basket made the entire season that doubled last season. So it's probably not a surprise. His uh, efficiency went down. He was asked to do a lot of things. His free throw rate went up. So you turned a guy who was a three point shooter into his three point rate went down. His free throw rate rate went up. His assist percentage went up. You turned a guy who was an effective three-point shooter into someone that had to get to the basket, drive and create for others, shoot fewer three-pointers. Naturally, he became a little bit of a less efficient player last season. His free throw percentage did go up, but he also shot uh, over twice as many free throws last year, close to, it was two and a half times as many free throws last season as he did his freshman year. So the belief is that as that coaches have is if they bring him in and don't put everything on his plate, which it wouldn't be at IU in this scenario, that he would be a better player and a, a more efficient player, at, uh, I should say, and a more effective player. Because if you take a little bit of, of his first year at Louisville, where he's a 36% three-point shooter, uh, and you mix it in with his second year at Louisville where he was a 81% free throw shooter who learned how to play make a little bit more and mix those together. You have a really good player. And I, that seems to be the belief that people have or the coaches have that are recruiting him. So I'm a little bit more in on going after L Ellis after kind of reading that and rethinking uh, how he would fit with the Hoosiers It would be interesting, and ultimately you're adding a guy that scored 17 points per game for an ACC team last year. Again, Louisville was hardly a basketball team, but he still was playing against good opponents and scoring. There's something to like there. So it seems like IU's really pushing for a visit. We'll see if they're able to do that, but... uh, an intriguing name that maybe give a little bit more thought to as uh, you kind of consider what the options are for the Hoosiers. Let's talk women's basketball transfer news because a very unlikely source broke that someone was on campus for a visit for the women's basketball team uh, this week. Plus we'll talk about some high school recruiting uh, for the men's basketball team as well. We'll do all that here in just one moment. So on the list of places that I ever expected to have uh, to publicly, quote-unquote, report transfer news, I didn't have Buffaloes on that list. Uh, it had been mentioned, those of you that might subscribe to PEGS or message boards or things like that, it had been mentioned that it sounded like uh, Lexi Darnisky was on campus or was had a visit scheduled for the women's team and on Thursday or excuse me on Wednesday even Buffalo Louis just tweeted out hey thanks to Lexi for visiting and we hope to see you back in the cream and crimson and attached her like thank you letter she sent when she was entering the transfer portal from Iowa State 
fair enough, I guess. Um, she very publicly, or they very publicly said, hey, Lexi was on campus. Well, let's look in to see who Lexi is. Uh, she spent has or spent three seasons at Iowa State. Last year averaged 12 points, 2.9 rebounds, 2.6 assists. Uh, shot 38% from the field, 31.8% from the three-point line. Her bread and butter is on the defensive end. She was a big 12 defensive player of the year in 2021-22. She was all defense last year on the all defensive team. She was all all defensive team the year before. She was all Big Ten first team 2021-22. She was uh, on the all Big 12 tournament team this year. So a very talented player that entered the transfer portal. If you look at what she did in the Big 12 tournament, uh, she dropped 20 points against Oklahoma. They ended up Iowa State winning the Big 12 tournament. Uh, most of her damage came in that uh, Oklahoma game to get her a spot on the All Big 12 tournament team, but she shot uh, 50% from three. But that's because most of those came in the um, in the first game again or in that game against Oklahoma. So last season, again, this is kind of a trend, and why you need to kind of take a, a deeper look at. The stats, again, someone that her usage rate went down last season technically, but she was still in a different role. She Her assist percentage went up. Her three-point rate went down. So it, it's kind of this interesting. She didn't necessarily get fouled more. She was just in a little bit of a different role because if you look at previous seasons, her freshman year, she gets to Iowa State and shoots 41% from three. And then shoots 37% from three her sophomore season. So last year is the outlier. She's a career 36.4% three-point shooter. That's good in the women's game. That is uh that I, I believe as I pull up the women's stats, that was right around where Sydney Paris shot last season. And to that point, Sydney Paris shot 36.7. Uh, Donarski is 36.4, so almost identical to that point about Parrish. I, te- I was texting Sabrina Merchant, who came on before the NCAA tournament to do a preview show for us. You everydayers will remember her coming on. I asked her, Hey, what do you know about her? Sabrina covers women's basketball way. I watch the Big Ten, she watches everything, and her response was very Parrishy in terms of us being a solid role player. That's a good defender. So, look, I love Sydney Parrish. I think all IU fans love Sydney Parrish. Let's add more of Sydney Parrish. So, that's the type of player. It's kind of a, a a real quick summary of her. Is she's very Parrish. She's someone that has been a very good three point shooter for her career. And you hope that she would be able to find that at Indiana. There's a there's a role there on the perimeter. We talked about they. IU kind of has five players locked in as starters. I don't know that Scalia necessarily is locked in as a starter. She had one tough season last year, uh, especially as the season went along. She really found herself in a shooting slump. If she breaks out of it and was the player she was kind of the beginning of the year and the player she was at Minnesota, absolutely. But there's some competition there. And if Lexi Darnesky comes in, then yeah, you have a lot of competition, but at the very least you're adding an elite defender and you can never have enough defense that fits right into IU's DNA in terms of being a program that's always kind of built on its defense. You're losing a really good defender in Grace Berger. You'd be gaining a really good defender in Lexi Darnisky. So a name to keep an eye on there. We have not talked high school basketball recruiting basically at all. Uh, It's been all transfer portal recruiting. IU hasn't stopped recruiting on the high school trail, though. 2024 recruit VJ Edgecombe tweeted out on Wednesday that he received an offer from the Hoosiers, a scholarship offer. He is a small forward listed at 6'5", 180 pounds. The number 48 prospect in the class, 
according to 247 Sports. Uh, he is ranked 43rd nationally uh, by 247 Sports. So he is, I mean, IU needs wing players. You can never have too many wing players. That alone makes him very enticing, but he's enticing to a lot of people. There are a lot of schools that have offered him scholarships. Miami, Michigan, Ohio State, Seton Hall, Tennessee, Villanova. I cut about half those names out. There are a dozen schools that have offered him a scholarship. Uh, 247 Sports had some stats and kind of analysis on him. Uh, He shot 41.3% on 58 three-pointers. 75% 75% on free throws uh, last year. He is someone that has length and versatility. And so uh, he played on the NIBC. So you're playing schools like Montvert, like IMG, La Lumiere, kind of the private school route. So when you talk about the stats, he's playing against good competition. He isn't playing in... I mean, for those of you that listened to yesterday's show, he wasn't playing in Arkansas. He was playing against elite competition, putting up those numbers. Uh, This is also from 247 Sports. Quote, behind his size and athleticism, Edgecombe projects well in many areas. He made a significant impact defensively for his team this season. Edgecombe blocked 1.6 shots per game, and as a wing, in addition to his two steals per game, His shooting percentages suggest that he will continue to progress in that area. So defense, uh, maybe not defensive-minded, but a wing that can play on both sides of the ball. We know how important defense is to Mike Woodson. And if you're able to make an impact on that end, you're definitely going to get his attention. So a name to monitor, the 2024 class, uh, it's going to be a really important one for the Hoosiers. They're going after a lot of really big names, but uh, Edgecombe, the latest one to add to that. Last thing, just to wrap up, we've mentioned this name before, just some kind of due diligence, just uh, closing the bag or whatever the saying is on this one. Garway Duell, who we mentioned, decommitted from Providence, and the Hoosiers had reached out to him. He recommitted to Providence, so he won't be coming to Bloomington. So, That gives you a lot of names to look up some highlights on, whether on the men's or women's side, college, high school. We can help you procrastinate the rest of the day now. Thanks again, guys, for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every day. We spent a lot of this week talking about Kalel Ware. We have everything you could want about him. Reaction to him uh, committing, talking about his fit offensively. And then for those that missed Thursday's episode, It was a whole episode talking about what type of player he was at Oregon with Locked On Ducks host Spencer McLaughlin. No one's going to have a better insight into how he played than Spencer, who watched him last season. So give that a listen for your second listen. Follow us on Twitter if you haven't already. Subscribe on YouTube. Let's get to 1,000 subscribers. Leave that rating and review, all of that great stuff. Most importantly, though, guys, hope everybody has a terrific weekend. And as always, LEO.